So again, thank you very much for inviting me today. It is a pleasure to join you in the Emphasis Seminar. Um, today, as Stephen was saying, I'm going to talk about natural science and the role of analogy in Descartes' theory of sensory perception. This is um, a project, a paper that has two aims. One, of course, is more general, is an overarching aim. The other one is more specific. So I would say that the overarching aim perhaps of my research project at the moment is to restore the notion of sign as a technical notion in Descartes' thought, right? So we know that the notion of sign is present, of course, in medieval and early modern discussions, but is rarely acknowledged as a technical term in Descartes' philosophy, side by side with that of substance, dualism, mind, objective reality, etc., so on and so forth. Right, so this is the overarching aim, right, to rehabilitate this notion of sign as a technical notion in Cartesian philosophy. For accomplishing that, of course, we have to mobilize certain uh, plenty of aspects of uh, Descartes' philosophy. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on one of them, right? So in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the occurrence of what Descartes calls natural science or science established by nature. Um, and I'm going to read the appeal to this type of science as a genuine attempt at understanding sensory perception. Right. So um, in order to provide more grounds for this reading of natural science, uh, I'm going to start, and this is the structure of the talk, with reconstructing very briefly a taxonomy of signs in Descartes, because perhaps we are not sufficiently aware um, of the contexts in which Descartes talks about signs and signification. I'm going to reconstruct very quickly, or rather briefly, the three contexts in which signs appear in Descartes. Then, in part two of the talk, I'm going to focus on the case of natural science, which is the case in which I'm most interested at the moment. And finally, since, as we shall see, natural signs appear in the Cartesian corpus, notably in the form of an analogy, as we'll see, I'm going to uh, give a uh, you know, couple of sense of the status of analogy if we are to understand natural science as such. So this is uh, my plan for today. I'm going to give um, a little bit of a preliminary before I start the reconstruction of the taxonomy of science so we can situate properly the discussion today. Right, so um, Descartes did not devote a specific work to develop a doctrine of semiotics, but he did use the notion of sign to describe three phenomena, language, the external movements of the passions, and sensory perception. For this, he appealed, he invoked conventional science, external science, and natural science, respectively. While the first two types of science, so conventional science and external science, are commonly analyzed as proper components of Descartes' considered views on language and the passions, natural science are often deemed as a figure of speech with no metaphysical import and no appreciable place in his thought. The objective of this talk today is to counter precisely this view and present two related points. As I was saying, first of all, I want to show that Descartes' identification of brain states with signs established by nature in the treatise on light amounts to a genuine attempt at understanding sensory perception. This is supported by Descartes' consistent usage of the notion of sign for capturing the, activi the activities exclusive to embodied minds. Second, reconstructing a taxonomy of signs and discerning the connections amongst its categories, this talk aims at, aims at rehabilitating, as I was saying, the notion of sign as a Cartesian technical notion. I find rather perplexing that even though Descartes um, made regular use of this notion in three distinct contexts, contexts. There is rarely a reference to it in Cartesian indexes and companions, and certainly no general understanding of it as a technical term in his philosophy. Right, so yeah, I cannot, there we go. So this is the first quotation that I want to present to you. Descartes opens the treatise on light 
the first part of his most ambitious project on the mechanistic theory of the natural world with a forthright statement about the difference that there might be between our sensory perceptions and their physical causes. He says the following, it is possible for there to be a difference between the sensation that we have of it, Descartes is talking here about light, the sensation that we have of light, that is the idea that we form of it in our imagination through the intermediary of our eyes and what it is in the objects that produces that sensation in us, that is what it is in the flame or the sun that we term light. Now this passage constitute a good summary of a well-acknowledged component of Descartes' account of perceptual cognition, a product of his commitment to a mechanistic theory of matter that is commonly labeled as dissimilarity thesis or in its problematized strain as dissimilarity problem. Now, although the mechanistic standpoint allowed for a variety of scientific theories, its pre-Newtonian version is generally defined as the view that all natural phenomena can be explained by appealing to a small range of quantifiable characteristic, characteristics of micro particles of homogeneous inert matter. In the Cartesian theory, as we know, these features are the shape, size, motion of microcorpuscles existing in a plenum, which constitute the clear and distinct, innately knowable true nature of physical objects. That is, the entirety of the res extensa, including, of course, the physiology of the human body. Then, within Descartes' dualism, sensory perception is equivalent to the interplay between the natural world, the brain, and the mind. His detailed mechanistic physiology accounted for the transmission of sensory information between external objects and the brain, and depicted this process as an isomorphic relation in which the characteristics of objects are communicated through the nerves as the motion patterns of its geometrically reduced properties. It is well known that targeting what he claimed to understand as a standard scholastic Aristotelian theory of perception, Descartes aimed to erase a number of traditional notions on the, char on the charges of unintelligibility and lack of explanatory power. Still, however, the promising explanatory power of the worldview of mechanistic natural philosophy, in which, in the words of Descartes, it is no less natural for a clock to tell time than it is for a tree to produce fruit. This was not devoid of challenges. A case in point is, of course, that of sensory perception. And this is the crux of the matter. Mechanism opened the gap between appearance and reality that proved difficult to bridge without the assistance of the sensible and intelligible species of the theories of the schools. Descartes had substituted the resembling species with motion, for example, yet what remained is a seemingly inscrutable dissimilarity between the quantitative nature of physical states, that is the states of objects and brains, and the qualitative character of mental states, the what it is like to have an idea of something. It is a textual fact that Descartes' explanation of sensory perception becomes elusive precisely in this phase, becomes elusive in the mental phase. And it is true that he did not present a perfectly unambiguous doctrine for it. This has led some commentators to claim that Descartes did not have any theory at all regarding sensory perception. However, I do think that this is rushed and uncharitable. I cite in this talk and in my current project with a variety of interpretations that have in common the fact of taking seriously Descartes' terminological nuances, as well as his effort <clears throat> for unifying his metaphysical views with his natural philosophy, despite the challenges of mechanistic production. The case on perception, in fact, casts light on this particular effort in a very clear way. This effort is that involved in the more general task of naturalizing the notion of the soul. That is the task of creating a theoretical space for the mind in the domain of naturalistic, yet not necessarily mechanistic explanation. Indeed, for describing the brain-mind stage of the process 
Descartes employs a plethora of different expressions, and this terminological effort seems aimed at preserving a delicate equilibrium between the evoking of causal activity and the dismissal of efficient or mechanical causation. To this effect, it is compelling to follow Descartes' usage of words for mind-body interaction in comparison to the words used for the interaction amongst bodies. Then we can discover what I call this delicate balance at work. The word cause for the case of brain and mind interaction rarely appears, yet causal language is incredibly prevalent. The general point is that no matter the diversity of expressions, perhaps we should not take that as a weakness in Descartes. We could take it perhaps as an effort for creating this theoretical space for the mind. Now, the general point, as I was saying, is that no matter the diversity of expressions and the air of periphrases that they often take, these expressions contribute to an important aspiration of Descartes and others at the time, namely that of procuring knowledge of the whole of the natural world to which the mind belongs in a way in which the material and the mental can be treated with equivalent systematicity without, at the same time, making the mind into something material or making the mind into something supernatural. Now, let us recall some of these familiar expressions. Descartes describes the interaction between the brain and the mind with terms such as make the soul sense, affect the soul, give means to the soul, and give occasion to the soul. We also find the terms excite and stimulate the mind. Now, it is precisely in this context, in the context of this variety of creative expressions for capturing interaction, that natural signs join in. Right after the opening statement of the treatise on, on light that we have just cited, Descartes deproblematizes this similarity between objects and ideas by drawing an analogy with the workings of, knowledge, of language. And he says the following. Now, with words, which signifies something only through human convention, are sufficient to make us think of things to which they bear no resemblance, why could not nature also have established some sign which would make us have the sensation of light, even if that sign had nothing in it that resembled this sensation? Our mind represents to us the idea of light each time the action that signifies it touches our eye. Now, the idea of this passage is something as follows. If words, being something that we have created, being conventional and entirely different to the things that they signify, are able to infallibly induce the mind to form something, to form the appropriate corresponding idea, nature should be all the more capable of having instituted a relation of signification between objects and sensory ideas. Now, interestingly, similar references to signs and signification for the case of sensory perception are dispersed, scattered throughout the Cartesian corpus. And this requires, of course, um, a bit of textual work. In Meditation 6, for instance, we are told that the motion patterns that reaches the internal cavities of the brain gives the mind its signal, signum, reads the original, for having a certain sensation. Descartes phrases the teleofunctional aspect of his theory of perception also in Meditation 6 within the same terminological frame. The perceptions of the senses have been given by nature to signify to the mind at menti significandum what is beneficial or harmful. In the comments on a certain broadsheet, one of his mature works in response to Regius, the relation between corporeal states and ideas is typified as an instance of signification. He says the following, and this is the third quotation. Everything over and above these utterances and pictures, which we think of as being signified by them, quan earum significata, is represented to us by means of ideas which come to us from no other source than our faculty of thinking. Finally, in the optics, the analogy of the treatise on light, notably, is resumed 
while reinforcing the plausibility of a notion of interaction along the lines of stimulation and signification. He says the following, our mind can be stimulated by many things other than images, by signs and words, for example, which in no way resemble the things that they signify. We must think of the images formed in our brain in just the same way. Now, these passages, I believe, open up the textual possibility of understanding the metaphysics of causation involved in sensory perception in terms of a semantic or linguistic model. In short, this refers to the understanding of the process of perception in a triadic relation between object, brain, and mind. Following the text, the brain state holds the role of the sign, the external object, becomes the referent or significatum, and the mind, in virtue by the code instituted by nature, comes to be an interpreter of this language of nature and produces a sensory idea. Now, while the issue of Descartes' theory of perceptual cognition, its merits and shortcomings, its scholastic depths and misunderstandings has generated, as we know, an ocean of literature, the use of natural science for the context of perception has received scant attention to my knowledge, and a comprehensive coverage of the topic is almost non-existent. One could readily think, of course, that this is because this is um, a glaring implausibility, right? So we should not be understanding Descartes in this way, or we should not be pinpointing this notion in order to, to understand Descartes' philosophy. Yet it is at least intriguing that a systematic of treatment, that a systematic treatment of Descartes' notion of sign is often resisted despite of the fact that the philosophical landscape of the time included well-established discussions on the nature and the uses of science. And considering, as we shall see, that Descartes used the term for three distinct subjects throughout his works. And these subjects, uh, as I said, are language, the passions, and finally, sensory perception. Now, once this big preliminary has been set, right? So once I've, I've presented what is uh, 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 the first textual basis for this reading of Descartes, I'm going to very briefly reconstruct a taxonomy of science so we can see whether there is a technical notion in play here. So the objective of reconstructing a taxonomy of science in Descartes, again, is to establish a useful comparison between types of science for understanding how he conceived of semantic relations and the motivations that he had for bringing them into play. Following the text, I shall be briefly looking at three categories, conventional, external, and natural science. Let us begin with conventional science, that is, science that denotes certain other things by means of human convention. For Descartes, the paradigmatic example of a system of conventional science is, of course, language. Descartes' conventionalist view about language means that there is no intrinsic natural connection between the linguistic sign, the word and the letter, and its referent, its significatum. For Descartes, precisely, a feature of semantic relations that is worth emphasizing is that despite the fact that there might be similarity between sign and referent, our thought is consistently compelled to form an idea of this referent. And I quote Descartes here, the fact that words bear no resemblance to the things they signify does not prevent them from causing us to conceive of those things, often without paying attention to the sound of those words. Now this presents a straightforward triadic scheme as mentioned above, in which words are signs, the objects that those words refer to is the referent or significatum, and the human being, upon having knowledge of the language in question, becomes the interpreter of this semantic relation. Now, interestingly, Descartes' usage of the category of external signs, now we go to the second type, maintains a similar scheme. We find this term, external or exterior signs, predominantly in the passions of the soul, where they are, they are identified as the signs of the passions. In Cartesian language, and of course, in general, in early modern vocabulary, 
passions refer broadly to what we nowadays catalog as emotions. It's coming from the Latin passio, a rendering from the ancient Greek pathos. The notion of passion was of course contrasted to that of action. While the former refers to the mind's passivity in receiving certain inputs from the body, the latter captures the mental operations that are initiated by the faculty of the will. Descartes calls the latter volitions. Now developing out from the correspondence with Elizabeth of Bohemia, the passions comprise then an exhaustive taxonomy of the kind of actions of the body upon the mind that we call emotions. Then the signs of the passions are called external due to the distinction that Descartes makes between the internal and the external movements of the passions as the two manifestation of the same passion of the soul. For example, in the case of the passion of joy, as Descartes describes it, the internal movements would correspond in the Cartesian theory to an abundant flow of animal spirits from the brain into those nerves which have the function of opening the orifices of the heart. The external movements of the passions can be diverse and they correspond to their external visible expression. In the same case of joy, the, its external signs would be, for instance, laughter or blushing. The external movements of the passions are then signs insofar they signify or bear witness to the passions. Now, lastly, Descartes makes use of natural signification as we were seeing before for describing the process of sensory perception. Now, the case of natural signs seems to be akin to the other two, to conventional and external signs. And it does not look like such a perplexing addition to the Cartesian theory if we consider a stable use of the notion in other contexts. Just like the other types of signs, a natural science is also, of course, dissimilar from the thing it signifies, but it is related to this thing in a non-conventional way, that is, in a natural way. Confronted in perception, with a causal transaction that seems intractable in mechanistic terms, Descartes summons here a different type of relation that could operate with analogous invariability and that could integrate the phenomenon of dissimilarity in a rather organic manner. Language, in this case, provides such a model, considering the remarkable, reliable connection that provides between objects, signs, and ideas, despite the fact that it is a human creation dependent on convention. If we look at the texts, regardless of whether one consider this notion a metaphor, an analogy, or a le legitimate metaphysical terms, natural signs are identified without exceptions with brain states in the picture. And they have the role of bridging the dissimilarity gap between external objects and sensory ideas in the mind. In sum, then, we are presented with three equ equivalent processes. It is worth noting that all three categories, conventional, external, and natural sign, appear consecutively as distinct in the same paragraph from the treatise on light that we were examining before. And let me quote really briefly the same passage. Now with words, which signify something only through human convention, are sufficient to make us think of things to which they bear, bear no resemblance, why could not nature also have established some sign which would make us have the sensation of light? And it is not thus that nature has established love, laughter and tear to make us read joy and sorrow in the faces of men. So in the same paragraph in the treatise on, on light, we have natural signs, conventional signs, and external signs. Now, of course, this taxonomy needs to have a use for us, needs to have an upshot. And the corollary that I would like to present is that for these three categories, Descartes is invoking them for the same purpose. Now, piecing together a taxonomy of science in Descartes is a helpful exegetical task to identify a technical term in use. Yet, aside from identifying a shared structure regarding the roles of sign, referent, and interpreter, what is most important to this exercise is to discern why Descartes is calling 
natural signs into use in these cases. Now, two notable features come, um, become immediately salient in these cases. The first one is that for all three cases, signs are invoked as a way for, of explaining the etiology of processes that are characterized by a fundamental dissimilarity between mechanistic explanations of the physical world and the qualitative nature of mental states. That is to say, the relation of signification appears to make sense of the dissimilarity thesis. And it does so for three very particular cases, namely precisely the three cases, language, passions, and sensory perception that mark for Descartes that which is exclusively human, that is the union of the mind and the body. This leads us to the second common trait, which highlights a corresponding textual fact. So second, it is important to notice that indeed, signs appear only when the human being enters the picture in the text. This points to a deliberate usage of the notion. Recall as a paradigmatic instance that Descartes makes linguistic competence the ultimate evidence for the presence of the mind. He makes the meaningful use of language the mark of the mental. He does consider, as we know, the use of language in non-human animals, following the common examples of parrots of magpies. Yet, to deal with such occurrence, he distinguishes between a meaningful and a meaningless use of language, where the former is the manifestation of the human versatility of reason, and the latter is the a purely physical stimulus response mechanism. Analogously, in the case of the passions, while a vaguer notion of passion referring only to the corporeal process of passions is attributed also to non-human animals, the allusion to external signs is confined to the appearance of the human being in the text, in reference to a phenomenon of dissimilarity that is unique to the very nature of embodied minds. Compare as an example, the occurrence of the notion external signs in the passions with the mere mention of external movements in the treatise on man, where Descartes' goal is to show how the functions of the vegetative and sensitive souls can be mechanized. So we have on the passions, the use of external signs and on the treatise on man, focus on the bodily machine, just external movements. Now these features, a shared scheme and a shared motivation for employing the notion of sign, increase the plausibility of the presence of a stable notion of signification across different uses. In consequence, I believe, one should be prepared to concede that the allusion to natural signs is also a serious and considered addition. In other words, natural signs preserve, I believe, a semantic framework that perhaps is not completely developed, but it's not foreign to Descartes' thought either. Now, before going any further, I would like just to add two cents to this section, elaborating a bit more on the parallel between conventional and natural signs. This sheds light upon the idea that signs mark the domain of that which is exclusively human and therefore are uniquely fitting for the case of perceptual cognition. It is important to identify that the topic of language appears in Descartes primarily as an argument for dualism and not as a self-contained topic of investigation in itself. As I was saying, while some non-human animals are able to mimic human speech, the distinctive feature of a meaningful use of language is what some scholars have called the intentional aspect of semantic competence. In other words, it is the capacity of the human being absent in, animal, in non human animals, stemming from the versatility of reason, to use interpreted conventional signs. To this effect, it has been, it has been pointed out that the, this idea, as signs as the mark of the mental, can be inscribed in a long standing tradition stemming from Augustine and present, of course, in the openly Cartesian logic of Port Royal, that identify that which is essential to human beings in the use and creation of signs. Now, the emphasis on that which is exclusively human flows through the entire taxonomy of science, 
and the lengthier treatment of language by Descartes illuminates particularly well the fact that a sign within dualist parameters is the technical notion that marks the embodied mind. Now, after we've checked briefly how to reconstruct this taxonomy of the uses of signs in Descartes, I'm going to focus on natural signs, which is uh, the interest uh, on, of my project at the moment, right? It's like, what, what kind of role do natural signs have in the theory of perception? Now, so far we have observed similarities between uh, types of signs, but it is a fact that the taxonomy is well delimited. There is a demarcation between these signs, therefore there must be some difference as well amongst them. Now we have observed, as I was saying, important similarities, and now it is time to look at one key difference that draws the line between conventional and natural signs to see what we can learn from it about these signs, these mysterious signs established by nature. This difference, I claim, is the model strength of the connection between the sign and its reference. Natural signs receive its name because they are related to the things they signify but not by natural and not human convention. Following the text, this seems to mean that while in the case of conventional signs, the relation if in question is fragile, though successful, we are a bit surprised that language functions so well. In the case of natural signs, the relation is robust and therefore successful. We are not surprised that nature functions so well. Remember how Descartes phrases this, if words which signify something only through human convention are sufficient to make us think of the things to which they bear no resemblance, why could not nature have established a similar semantic scheme, we could say? Now it is clear that Descartes' reasoning here seems to work with a hidden premise, namely that the human convention is an imperfect version of a convention established by nature, or in other words, that anything that humans can do, nature can do more perfectly. This type of assumption, assumption suggests a systematic treatment or a considered perhaps treatment of natural science by Descartes, for it equips an analogy, the analogy between perception and language, with a claim about the model strength of relations instituted by nature. Presumably, something that makes nature's working superior in this respect is the fact that the correlation between signs and reference is not subjected, of course, to human will or to human convention. In a word, we could say, if human convention being so counterfactually weak in a conventionalist model like the Cartesian model is able to exert in our, on our mind such an influence in such a consistent and effective manner, natural ordination is, of course, all the more capable of bridging this gap between the physical and the mental. If something human made like language can operate despite the presence of complete dissimilarity, something instituted by nature can all the more bridge this gap mutatis mutandis. And the result after all relevant changes have been made reveals that in the case of natural science, the correlation between sign and reference is in a way necessary. Consequently, the analogy with conventional signs seems to serve the purpose of introducing an important point that made the important point that nature works by means of a more sophisticated semantic scheme. We could even introduce here the notion of a language of nature as analogous to human language. The language of nature has its own signs, its own type of convention, you know, and of course, its own creator with capital C. An urgent question, however, appears now. What does it mean that the connection between sign and significatum is necessary in this particular sense? One could rightly object to this point, that natural institution is in no way superior to human convention because both are recognized by Descartes as contingent. And certainly, Descartes seems to give that impression. He asserts on several occasions that the specific correlations between physical and mental states, the ones that we are familiar with, could, could have been otherwise very easily. An illustrative example of this topic appears in Meditation 6, 
in the context of recounting the union of the mind and body. Descartes tells us, I open quote, God could have made the nature of man such that this particular motion in the brain indicated something else to the mind. It might, for example, have made the mind aware of the actual motion occurring in the brain or in the foot, or it might have indicated something else entirely. The idea that Descartes is toying with is that actually there's nothing that prevents the fact that I could be perhaps touching fire and feeling pleasure instead of pain. And this is not only because of the omnipotence of God. And this, this is also, and I think most importantly, because the dissimilarity between mental states and physical states give these correlations an air of arbitrariness that Descartes is not comfortable with, right? And he, he feels that he needs to explain this. What Descartes is telling us here, I believe, is that upon the inspection of any type of sign, one could never infer a priori the type of response that this sign will elicit in the mind. And in this particular respect, natural, conventional, and external signs are perfectly on a par. This, to, uh, to gain knowledge of what it is that a sign represents a priori, is impossible. It is, it is only possible to do that by gaining knowledge of a code, that is, knowledge of the particular correspondences and its expected outcomes. This is certainly, as I was saying, common to external, conventional, and natural signs. However, this does not lead to arbitrariness in the case of natural signs. While it is true, as Descartes says, that God could have made the nature of man so that the touch of fire produces pleasure instead of pain, there is a sense in which brain states are correlated with mental states in a more robust, stable way, insofar they are a product of natural institu institution instead of human will, and crucially, as we know, natural institution is identified in Descartes with an optimal divine order aimed at the preservation of the human being. The institution of nature as emanating from God's initial act of ordination via a principle of parsimony grounds them as correlation that in that particular sense could not have been otherwise. Following up on the idea of the language of nature, it seems clear that for Descartes, the agency behind the creation of natural science is God's intentionality. That is the intentionality of the omnipotent, benevolent, and immutable creator of the laws of nature. For this idea, recall, for instance, as a helpful comparison, how in chapter seven of the Treatise on Light, Descartes justifies the immutability of the two laws of motion precisely on the omnipotence and benevolence of God. Now, we've given, I believe, I've given, I believe, some sort of textual support and argumentative support for understanding uh, natural science in this context. And now I would like to move to the second part of the talk and talk a bit about the intellectual context for this discussion, which is something, of course, that um, should be shown if we are to defend that Descartes is actually using this as a technical notion. Now, it is important to start with some precedents, right? So as I was saying at the beginning of, of the talk, it is important to point out that the study of the nature and the type of science flourished during the Middle Ages and it became a common topic in the disputationes of the lay scholastics. Specifically, the Conimbricenses or the Coimbra commentators produce an in-depth treatment of semiotics that Descartes most possibly read during his studies at La Fleche. We know that because he reminisces about uh, those thinkers twice in his correspondence with Mersenne. Descartes does not acknowledge a concrete influence of the Conimbricenses on his thought. Yet that is not his habit regarding um, scholastic depths or other types of intellectual depths. But it is nevertheless worth noting that they examine the nature of science in their commentary of Aristotle's De Interpretatione, the most exhaustive to appear at the time. Given the far-reaching influence of the Conimbricenses at the time, I shall use their exposition of the topic to draw a parallel with this Descartes usage. Yet this is not to say that they are the only direct or indirect source of it. Rather, 
they play here in my talk the part of a representative token of an established intellectual context. So my exposition of the precedents in terms of science will be limited to this textbook presentation of the Coimbra commentators, and perhaps we can talk um, in more detail in, in our discussion time about it. Now, what is important for my purposes here is that the Conimbri census drew five distinctions between types of signs, and two of them are reflected in Descartes' own treatment. The first one is a distinction between natural signs and signs by institution that is, of course, akin to the one that Descartes establishes between natural and conventional signs. Now, most importantly, however, the use of signs in the context of the very process of perceptual cognition had been explored before Descartes by the Conimbrithensis and others. And this is apparent from the second distinction that I want to point out. This is the distinction between instrumental and formal signs. An instrumental sign is a sign of which we are aware of as an external object. A word, for instance, is a sign of this type. We are acquainted with that sign as such, and by mediation of it, we also get to know what is referring to. Now, in contrast, formal signs are themselves not known as objects of experience, but they have the role of producing knowledge in the words of the Conimbri senses by informing, by giving form to a cognitive power. They are the mediators in acts of cognition. So I do not know them as objects, but they enable my cognition of other objects. Now, conventional and external signs, if we take Descartes' terminology, are known themselves as objects to trigger the formation of an idea. Yet natural signs do not seem to be instrumental signs, of course. They enable the very formation of sensory ideas without being themselves objects of our awareness. Just like the formal signs of the late scholastics, natural signs in Descartes seem to have the function of making cognition itself possible. Now, of course, the reader will um, rightly object at this point that even if it's only due to Descartes' own insistence, we should be very wary of attributing him a well-rooted scholastic notion for such a central theory in his corpus as it is sensory perception. And I'd say that two points are in order for addressing this concern. Now, first of all, the attribution to Descartes of a scholastic notion, as I was saying, is certainly debatable, mainly because of we know of his overall intellectual aim of replacing the philosophy of the schools. If anything, it seems that we should be reading him as drifting away from those notions. At the same time, it is not controversial to say within the Cartesian scholarship that this should not be taken at face value. Descartes maintained, in fact, scholastic metaphysical terminology, notably from Suarez and Fonseca, as well as actual bits of philosophy. For instance, let's say the distinction between formal and objective reality, the ontological proof for the existence of God, etc. To this conclusion, it is also worth recalling, as pointed out, uh, as hinted before, that the distinction between natural and conventional signs outlived Descartes in Cartesianism, not only in the poor royal logic, but also in La Forge and in Cordemois. But in order to answer this objection, most importantly, I would like to point out something about the usage, the usage of natural signs in Descartes as opposed to that of formal science in the Conimbrithenses and other thinkers. Now, we know that Descartes' main charge against the standard Aristotelian scholastic account of sensory perception, as he understood that, concerns the similarity thesis accompanied by the doctrine of the transmission of a sensible species from the object to the mind of the perceiver. It is in this particular respect that Descartes departs clearly from a purely scholastic usage of the notion of science. For him, any perception model should be subordinated primarily to the outcomes of natural philosophy and the resemblance policy of the scholastics, if uh, he identifies it as such, is not one of these consequences of natural philosophy. Descartes Descartes' stance against the scholastic theory of perception is not compromised by the introduction of the notion of natural science 
precisely because he invokes them to deal with similarity precisely and not with similarity. Now, crucially, a scholastic account like the one we find in the Conimbricenses identified formal signs with the sensible species transmitted from the object as a form without matter. Descartes, however, if we look at the texts, was careful enough to assign the role of the sign to brain states accounted for mechanistically and was emphatic beyond doubt and perhaps to the point of caricature about eliminating the obscure species fleeting through the air, as he says. So in this sense, it can be argued that he made the necessary changes for the theory not to be Aristotelian scholastic in its most substantial aspect. It is helpful to recall here the passage of the optics where Descartes retains the traditional word image for referring to the brain state, but urges the reader to think of these states in an entirely different manner from that of the philosophers, meaning, of course, the philosophers of the schools. Now, finally, something that I would like to address before I finish this talk is the fact that we cannot um, obviate the fact that natural science, although appear in different contexts scattered throughout Descartes' work, they appear most notably in the form of an analogy in the treatise on light. And we should address the fact um, that perhaps this formulation uh, being part of an analogy diminishes the metaphysical value of, of, of this, of this uh, notion. Now, in order to address this concern, I would like to um, I would like to give a couple of pointers regarding um, Descartes' um, views on analogy, just to make sure that even if we consider natural science as a pure analogy, a one-off occurrence in the treatise on light, we should be very careful to say that that means that they don't have place in the theory, because analogies for Descartes are um, tools for, this, for the discovery of truths. They are not figures of speech, right? So now um, I would like to make a couple of brief points. This of course does not exhaust Descartes' views on analogy, but I, I think they will suffice for giving uh, some support to my view. Now, first of all, it is well known that it was Descartes' habit to use analogies, what he calls comparisons, comparationes, and similitudinum for scientific purposes, and importantly, he did reflect on the uses and nature of analogies, notably in the correspondence with Morin, to whom he responds in what could sound to us as a rather contemporary voice, that regulated analogies ability is at least one of the tests that confirms the truth of a scientific claim. Analogies, he writes, are the most appropriate means available to the human mind for laying bare the truth of the truth in problems of physics. I would go so far as to say that when someone makes an assertion concerning nature, which cannot be explained by any such analogy, I think I have demonstrative knowledge that the point is false. Now a reading of Descartes' notion of analogy solely as a tool of discovery fails to capture a strong statement like this which points at the fact that he also saw them as conditions operating in what we now call the context of justification of a theory. Some of Descartes analogies can indeed be taken as creative tactics, tactics with clear resolutions. I'm thinking, for example, of the fable of the world. But its most common use seems to be that of generally constructing and confirming scientific claims. As an example, considers consider Descartes' lengthy analogical treatment of the transmission of light in chapter 14 of the treatise, and how he considered that methodologically normative and unquestionably connected to scientific truth. My second point is that, as you can see, I have dubbed Descartes' view regulated analogies ability because he introduces, in fact, certain rules to generate what he considers proper analogies. So not every analogy is a good analogy and not every analogy is conducive to truth. This is particularly important for my interpretation because it illuminates the point 
that analogies for Descartes what confirms a scientific claim precisely by ensuring, ensuring that it is free of the excesses of the imagination that he had diagnosed in other theories, eminently in those of the scholastic tradition, but also, as we know, uh, of other medieval thinkers like Ramon Llull, he considered his thought as mere fancies, something like that. Now he shares what he understood as the problem of scholastic analogies in correspondence again with Morin, identifying in fact, these analogies between elements of different, different ontological classes. And he says the following, this is the second quotation. The analogies that are usually employed in the schools explain intellectual matters by means of physical ones, substances by means of accidents, or at any rate, one quality by means of a quality of a different kind, and they are not very instructive. Paired with Descartes' well-known charges of obscurity, this attitude is interestingly, interestingly in line with the multifaceted methodological shift at the turn of the 17th century, where amongst other, Bacon was championing the use of analogy in science as an antidote for an uncontrolled imagination. In this respect, Cartesian analogy can be seen as a methodical, rationalist tool to counter the ontologically loaded empiricism that he had identified in his scholastic teachers. Descartes comparaciones linked objects that are similar in a fundamental sense, and so Descartes writes, in the analogies which I employ, I compare movements only with other movements, shapes with other shapes. That is, I compare things that are too small to be perceived by the senses with other things that can be so perceived. This leads us to the final point. Descartes notes here something important, which is that his analogies are not only, his analogs, sorry, are not only on the same ontological category, but he describes the context in which he employs analogy, namely in the endeavor of explaining the microscopic by means of the macroscopic, or in other words, in making the invisible visible. The fact that the discussion of the use of analogy happens in the domain of the problems of physics instead of the specific context of sensory perception should not deter us. It is not odd to think of analogies as proper components of all inquiries in natural philosophy, and that includes for Descartes a theory of perception that starts in the corporeal sphere, sphere and culminates in the mind. That Descartes did not entirely accomplish this is one thing, but that he did try is apparent from the texts. It is precisely in the treatise on light, Descartes' most ambitious exposition of natural philosophy, that natural signs appear in the context of perceptual cognition, a topic to be later expanded in the treatise on man. In a wider context, one can see Descartes' use of the sign analogy a proper tool of confirmation, as we have seen, the struggle for creating a theoretical space for mental operations, that is a domain for a systematic treatment of the mind in a naturalistic and not mechanistic, in the case of Descartes, manner. Lastly, using an analogy for the case of perception, especially an analogy involving the technical notion of sign, seems particularly fitting, it seems so far as it exemplifies an acute case of invisibility, a phenomenon whose nature we cannot entirely grasp and that calls for a new, unaccustomed way of thinking about it, just for instance, like the microcorpuscular theory of matter did. This echoes a point in Descartes' response to Elizabeth of Bohemia upon her objection of, of intelligibility in the causal relation between mind and body. He recommends, he recommends that we think of the interaction between finite substances with a notion of causal power, what he calls force, that we are not habituated to consider. Now, certainly, Descartes hinted in different moments at a metaphysically interesting distinction between types of causes that require us to broaden our metaphysical and naturalistic horizon. Perception, an instance of mind, body to mind interaction, seems to be an illustrative case here. At the same time, we know that Descartes' endeavor of explaining perceptual cognition 
does not come to fruition in all its aspects. He never developed a complete account of his, these other causes, and we don't know whether signification figured as one of those other causes. We, he encountered precisely in that domain, in the domain of perception, with special clarity, the explanatory limitations of the mechanical picture of nature. Some of his expositions have an indeterminate tone. Some others might seem disappointing at first glance. The case of natural science, though well supported, I believe, in the ways that I have shown throughout this talk, is also affected by this indeterminacy that we find in Descartes. He attempted to systematize the variant of mind and body interaction that is sensory perception as much as possible by exhausting all the naturalistic devices at his disposal, by grounding it as much as possible on the capabilities and activities of the human brain and the human mind. He identified a fundamental dissimilarity between physical and mental states. He described meticulously the formation of an isomorph of the object in the brain by a reduction to motion. And he envisaged a distinction between types of causes. For this, the text showed that he contemplated a causal power along the lines of stimulation, perhaps signification, and a perfectly law-like relation between objects and ideas that find a fitting model in the natural sign relation. With this, one might say, he touched naturalistic explanatory bedrock. This directs us once more to the correspondence with Elizabeth, where Descartes claims that ultimately, the union of the mind and body can only be experienced, but not systematized by the intellect. Something similar might be happening with perception, as it, insofar as it is a product of the union. We would like to know more about this interpretative activity of the mind upon the occurrence of certain brain states or natural signs. But Descartes does not seem to have much more to say about the matter. Beyond the interpretation of natural signs, the metaphysics of mental causation do not seem accessible. Now in sum, an analogy involving the technical notion of natural sign, I believe has the proper credential for naturalistic explanation it reveals, the feature, it reveals the feature of the theory that Descartes had identified and qualified as much as possible the metaphysics of causation involved. Beyond that, it seems that natural signs simply have to be interpreted just like words are read as understood and just as the union is lived. Now, a couple of concluding remarks and that I, I will stop talking and we can start discussing. Now, one needs to mobilize, as we've seen, uh, loads of different areas of Descartes' thought to fully rehabilitate the notion of sign as a technical Cartesian notion and for highlighting the weight of the language analogy in the case of sensory perception. Now, against readings that consider natural signs as a textual and philosophical variety, this talk has offered, I believe, a contribution to this project in the form of a reconstruction of a taxonomy of sign relations as marks of embodiment, and centered on the case of natural signs as a genuine feature of Descartes' understanding of sensory perception, even if we cannot reconstruct a perfect uh, seamless model with them. Considerations on his uses of analogy have been completely, I believe, disconnected in the literature from assessments of the meaning of the language analogy. Yet they provide, I believe, important support for a reading of natural signs as revealing a truth about the natural process of cognition. On a more general note, this work, I believe, considers Decker's claims about perception under a more optimistic and charitable sense, not as problems to be solved, but as contributions to the relatively unmapped field of the insightful and creative strategies from the explanatory task of naturalizing the notion of the soul in the early modern period. So thank you very much for listening, everyone.